First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Welcome to WUFT News First at Five. I'm Kennedy Mason. And I'm Charlize Ramos. Thanks for joining us. Last night, Mayor Harvey Ward and other city commissioners were at the University of Florida to discuss student transportation and traffic safety. Yes, inside the UF Senate chamber, the UF Senate and the commission discussed road improvements in the city and other topics. Several students asked questions and raised concerns about certain roads and sidewalks that impact them. Sophia Ward rides her bike to campus every day which she says can be a frustrating experience. Pedestrians are distracted. The bicyclists don't have another place to go. The people on scooters are trying to wiggle their way in between. People are going onto grassy medians, which are really bumpy. You could crash really easily. Like this. At the meeting, Mayor Harvey Ward informed students about several improvements the city has made on the roads through federal grants. Vehicle restricted areas on campus, the University Avenue project, and Southwest Gainesville transportation improvements. But some students tell me they are still concerned about pedestrian and road safety even after the changes made by the commission over the past few years. At the meeting, Sophia brought up her concerns about 13th Street near Uly Hall and the Norman area, a street with a sidewalk on one side of the street, but not the other. I'm sympathetic to the city's position. I know it's a big project to take on, but I also just know that it didn't need to be designed that way in the first place. But no changes to 13th Street quite yet. So following uh, the changes in uh, University Avenue, we'll be uh, very focused on uh, 13th Street next. Ward said that this year there have been seven deaths in Gainesville this calendar year. If anyone is dying on our streets, it's too many. Sophia said she hopes the city can start on the 13th project soon. It is just a shame how slow things have to move when there's that's not going to match the pace of how many people are moving into Gainesville. To prevent any more deaths in Gainesville this year and the years to come. Mayor Ward explained the city is always studying how to improve pedestrian safety in response to student concerns. Police in Gainesville are searching for the man they say broke into a woman's home and sexually assaulted her. Early Tuesday morning, police responded to the home on Southwest 10th Street. The victim says the suspect entered her room and was while she was sleeping. Police say he then started battering the woman and ran off when she called out for help. Investigators say they are looking for a white man in his 20s with light blonde hair or light or brown hair. He was last seen wearing a light blue polo shirt, shorts, and his face was covered. If you have any information about this investigation, you're asked to call GPD. In Marion County, we're working to learn what led to a deputy involved shooting this morning. It happened on Highway 41, just north of the small town of Dunnellan. The sheriff's office says no deputies were heard and the suspect who was shot will survive and is being treated at a local hospital. Once we gather more information, we'll bring it to you on WUFT.org. A large paper mill is closing in the city of Perry, Florida, putting many community members out of their jobs. WUFT News reporter Bailey Cornick has more information on the closure. Taylor County's Board of Commissioners met Tuesday regarding the permanent closure of Georgia Pacific Cellulose Mill. The closure means cutting over 500 jobs in Perry, Florida. City leaders are looking out for these people as they find new opportunities. A small town recently ravaged by Hurricane Idalia is taking another hard hit. Perry, Florida is still in recovery mode. But the closure of the Georgia Pacific Cellulose Mill creates more uncertainty for the community. The Taylor County Board of County Commissioners met Tuesday to discuss the permanent closure of the mill. According to the company press release, 525 employees will be left out of a job. It states, ultimately, GP does not think the mill can competitively serve its customers in the long term, despite significant investments and commitment by GP Cellulose since the site was acquired in 2013. Over 40 people appeared at the meeting, voicing their concerns. City manager John Hart even called the mill the lifeblood of Perry. He isn't the only one. Congressman Neil Dunn posted a statement addressed to the president of the company. He issued a list of demands based on community feedback. First on that list, 
extend health care benefits, pay, and severance for at least six months. In the news release, Georgia Pacific thanked its employees for their hard work and said the company will work with them to find job placement resources. Career Source North Florida announced in the meeting it will be working with Taylor County to help those impacted from the November 1st closure. As for now, the city of Perry hopes the effects don't trickle down into the economy. Environmentals, environmentalists have long blamed the mill pollution in the Fen Hallway River, which once was considered one of the most polluted waterways in Florida. When Georgia Pacific acquired the plant, they poured in $300 million into restorative efforts to clean it up. Live in the newsroom, Bailey Cornick, WUFT News. The Department of Children and Families announces the Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Program in response to Hurricane Idalia. DSNAP will provide food and assistance for individuals and families impacted by the storm. The program will begin on Monday, September 25th. It will apply to people who live or work in one of the 11 counties listed on your screen right now. The first step is to pre-register on the DSNAP website at myflfamilies.com DSNAP. There you can also find specific requirements on whether you qualify. You know, I'm really hoping we keep this dry weather up, Kennedy. Me too. Mm -hmm. I am not looking forward to any rain. <laughs> Definitely not. Well, WFT's Derek Getter joins us now with the weather forecast and what, what we can expect. Charlie's and Kennedy, thankfully, most of that rain is south of Marion County. Gainesville and all the surrounding counties are continuing to remain dry. Now we are seeing those clouds beginning to funnel in out west, which could pave the way for some rain this afternoon and evening. It's 88 degrees, but it feels like 90 as that moisture begins to build back in. So most of us are seeing 87 degrees, 86 in St. Augustine, 84 over in Lake City. I'll walk you through future cast in just a couple of minutes. The city of Gainesville's golf course, Ironwood, is in danger of being shut down. Caitlin Schiffer joins us live with a preview of a new city audit that says the course is losing money. The new report is 15 pages of scrutiny regarding operations of inventory and purchasing, but it could trigger a larger discussion about the golf course losing money year after year. Ironwood is a home to many golfers here in Gainesville. Over the past three fiscal years, it has experienced hundreds of thousands of dollars of losses in revenue. Many golfers come to the course because it brings them a sense of community. It provides me and my family with an outlet for golf, and more so it's a community center, and it, is a, uh, it has become a hallmark for the east side of Gainesville. A recent audit from the city shows over the past fiscal year, the golf course lost over $100,000. At Tuesday's city commission meeting, board members discussed the closure of Ironwood Golf Course. Many frequent golfers like Bob Munson believe this decision would be a big mistake. Sometimes you've got to spend a little more than you take in just for the, for the, for the benefit of the community. You know, I've noticed playing here that there are a lot of uh, a lot of ordinary working people that probably can't afford a country club and really in Gainesville there's not that big a choice of country clubs so I think this is real important to a lot of people in Gainesville. Golfers believe that improvements can be made to the course to generate more revenue. The city uh, should be looking at trying to improve the conditions at the golf course to promote uh, more revenue and more intake and more participation. For Gainesville golfers, this can mean an end to their days on the green. Iron One was mentioned in a state audit where the GRU debt overshadowed everything else. Reporting live, Caitlin Schiffer, WUFT News. A recent complaint by a parent has a Gainesville High School club under investigation. The school district is working to determine if an employee violated the school board policy by overseeing the club that tailors its members to a certain demographic. WUFT's Juan Carlos Chawi is live in the studio with more on the complaint and response. During a school board meeting last night, Alachua County Schools informed parents and students of the complaint, but they did not offer any other details besides the fact that they are looking into it. Part of the complaint alleges that the extracurricular activity is only targeted towards black male students. Several dozen people attended the meeting and many say this is a non-issue and support the club's existence, including a member and his mother. 
it could really be for anybody because it's it's a mixture of a whole bunch of students. We have students that aren't in so much higher classes, and we have students that are above average. So I just feel like it's a way for all the most of the ninth grade students in our school to come together as a as a whole and make like a brotherhood and help each other keep each other grades up. I feel like long as the children and the staff are working diligently towards making the program perfect, I think that's all that matters to me. In a brief statement, the school board only acknowledged that the parent filed the complaint against the employee. The rep goes on to say that any information about the complaint is confidential until 10 days after their investigation is complete. Once that information is released, we will update you here and on WUFT.org. Live in the studio, Juan Carlos Chawi, WUFT News. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Coming up when WUFT's First at Five returns. The results are in for the Ocala City Council election. Who won and how by how big of a margin? Plus, a bear shuts down parts of Disney, where officials say the unusual park goer is now. All that and more coming up on WUFT News First at Five. You're watching WUFT TV News. Nearly three months ago, a teenage girl found herself trapped in her home. A tree had crashed into the room where she was sleeping. Crews had to stabilize the roof and use chainsaws to cut her free. Now that crew is being honored for their work. The city of Ocala highlighted Juliana Ting for her bravery, along with the teamwork of each department that helped with the rescue. Those crews included Marion County Fire Rescue, Ocala Fire Rescue, and the Ocala Police Department. Ocala Fire Rescue says, quote, seeing her three months later, having made a full recovery, was simply priceless. The results are in for the Ocala City's Council's District 2 seat. Democratic incumbent Ira Bethe Sr. defeated Republican challenger Reginald Landers Jr. Bethe won with nearly 68% of the vote. Out of nearly 38,000 registered voters, only about 3,000 cast their ballot. A bear that prompted authorities to close parts of Disney's Magic Kingdom is free and roaming a new park today. There she goes, Florida Fish and Wildlife Bear Management staff posted this video of the bear heading off into the Ocala National Forest. The bear caused a bit of a ruckus Monday morning when Walt Disney World confirmed the bear was spotted in a tree on Disney property. Several attractions were closed. FWC released the bear on the Lake Marion County line in the Ocala National Forest and says she's doing well. The University of Florida Women's Club celebrates unveiling of a historic marker today after working with UF for a year to have it installed. Alumni gathered to celebrate 100 years of the club and the service it has provided to the university. They really shared nice stories to about the their time here, right where. and how meaningful the plaque is to them. Where we originated and then where we continued. The UF Library has taken all the club's archives to preserve them and commemorate the club's contributions. I'm really glad that those showers and storms are staying south for the most part. Me too. I am not really looking forward to any rain, but WFT's Zara Getter has more on our evening outlook. Showers and storms are popping up and down the state. We'll talk about that timing in just a few minutes. You're watching WUFT TV News. Temperatures right now at 88 degrees, but it feels like 90 as that moisture begins to build back in. We are seeing lots of overcast, which could pave the way for some showers and storms later on this evening. But right now, most of the rain is south of Marion County. Let's talk about that timing, though. This is 7 o'clock. I do think that this is a tad overdone. We'll continue to see those showers and storms, I think mainly south of Gainesville and especially along the East Coast. Now 11 o'clock, those storms will continue skirting off to the east and then we'll see mostly dry conditions, a few lingering showers, but otherwise mostly dry and mostly cloudy. Now these rain chances are thanks 
to the stalled out front we have just sitting at the tip of the peninsula, building in a lot of moisture along the interior. So we'll continue to see those high rain chances tomorrow and then pretty warm and muggy conditions tonight. Nearly 70 degrees in Gainesville and in Alachua, 68 degrees, 71 over in the villages. So as you plan your day tomorrow, we'll have partly sunny skies in the morning, a nice northeast wind in the afternoon, so it'll feel pretty comfortable. And then that's when we'll up our rain chances in the late afternoon, early evening hours. So as you're heading home from work or picking the kids up from school, that's when we'll bump those rain chances up to 40%, two, three, four, five o'clock. So here's where we are in our hurricane season. We're just over the peak and today state officials announced a groundbreaking new emergency operational facility which can withstand 200 mile per hour winds. Now thankfully we're not dealing with anything of that magnitude here in the tropics. We do have this wave off the coast of Africa which has a high chance of becoming a tropical depression late this week and as we head into the weekend Hurricane Nigel, a category one hurricane is going to continue moving north into northern Europe so that won't affect us either but we are closely monitoring this area of low pressure which isn't tropical but could develop some tropical characteristics especially along the coast like beach erosion gusty winds and heavy downpour so we'll continue to monitor that but that won't really affect us inland here where we are in Alachua County. So dry Friday, Saturday and Sunday, which means we're about to crank up the heat. 90s are back on Monday and Tuesday. Coming up in sports, former Gator baseball player Wyatt Lankford has been tearing it up in the minor leagues. Also, Gators football is preparing for their upcoming matchup against Charlotte. Tune in after the break to see what offensive lineman Richie Leonard has to say. You're watching WUFT TV News. Good evening and welcome into sports. I'm Jamie Goldman. Gator Nation is still feeling good after Florida football's win against 11th ranked Tennessee last Saturday. The Gators offense got off to a hot start, scoring four touchdowns in the first half. A major reason for their early success on Saturday was the running game. Trevor Etienne rushed for over 170 yards in the ball game and added a touchdown. Fellow running back Montrell Johnson found the end zone as well. Junior offensive lineman Richie Leonard says it's great when everybody is doing their part on offense. You know, it's, it's just a great feeling to, to be hitting on all cylinders as an offense. You know, a lot of a lot of people contribute to the run game, you know, whether that's receivers doing their job on the edges, quarterback giving the ball to the running back, the running back doing, doing his job. So uh, it, it's nice when we're hitting on all cylinders like that, for sure. Gators football will look to stay hot this weekend as they welcome the Charlotte 49ers into the swamp. Gators soccer and head coach Samantha Bohan are looking for their first SEC win of the season as they head to Tennessee to face the Volunteers tomorrow night. Florida is hoping to get back on track after back-to-back one-goal losses to Missouri and Florida State. Gators leading scorer Megan Hinnenkamp netted her fourth goal of the season in the loss to Missouri. First touch against the Volunteers is set for tomorrow night at 7 p.m. from Regal Soccer Stadium in Tennessee. In Gator softball, the Southeastern Conference announces their schedule for the 2024 softball season today. SEC conference play will begin on March 8th and run through May 5th. The Gators will open SEC play on the road as they head to Alabama to face the Crimson Tide on March 8th. The first SEC home series for Florida will begin March 22nd as the Gators welcome the Kentucky Wildcats into Gainesville. The 2024 SEC tournament is scheduled to kick off May 7th at Jane B. Moore Field in Auburn, Alabama. Switching over to baseball, former Gators outfielder Wyatt Langford continues to impress as he makes his way through the minor leagues. After being drafted by the Texas Rangers fourth overall on, Jul on July 9th, Langford has quickly moved up in the Rangers minor league system. He started in single A Hickory before being called up to the double A Frisco Rough Riders. During his time in Frisco, Langford posted an impressive 405 batting average to go along with four home runs. The Rangers took notice promoting Langford to triple A after just 12 games. Langford picked up right where he left off, making a splash in his AAA debut. Last night for the Round Rock Express, Langford recorded four hits, including a double, and showed off his speed, adding a stolen base as well. That's it for sports. I'm Jamie Goldman. Thanks, Jamie. 
One Gainesville nonprofit is raising $2,000 to save a disabled rabbit. Gainesville Rabbit Rescue is helping Hercules get a CAT scan. When he first arrived to the shelter, he had no control of the left side of his body and was infested with worms. Since starting treatment, Hercules gained the ability to stand, but still can't walk on his own. The organization is partnering with Black Aider Brewery for the month of September to raise money for his medical expenses. Donations to Hercules' treatment can be made through the brewery or directly to the Gainesville Rescue, Rab Rabbit Rescue. It looks like those ranch chances are really holding steady, Dara. Rain chances are holding steady, Kennedy, but not for long. We'll have a 30% chance of rain tonight, and then we'll see a little bit more warm and muggy conditions with temperatures in the 70s. Back to the desk.